Hello, my name is Megan Mahalik, and I will be discussing women in early 20th century St. Elizabeth's Hospital for the Insane. So, St. Elizabeth's was a government hospital that um, was constructed in 1855. It was in Washington, D.C. So, that's why the government opened the hospital was technically on federal land instead of state land. And they also felt like they needed one for their servicemen. So, the name was actually changed from Government Hospital for the Insane to St. Elizabeth's, which had always been the unofficial name for it because it was the name of the land initially. And it, that name was changed in 1916. So over through its many years, it had many different add-ons. Uh, the picture that you see off to the side right here is the main building, the administrative building, which was the original building constructed on the site. Um, you have that central entryway, and then you have two V-like wings going off from there. So this was this was a hospital that when it was built, it was a segregated facility. And throughout its time, it was always segregated. And segregated did not just mean racial lines. It was also gender lines, as well as actual mental illness. They separated different uh, mental illnesses. So you had African Americans, Anglo white people, so criminals, they had criminals there and they were segregated. Like I mentioned, women, as this was a government hospital, veterans stayed there as well as military personnel and they had their and they were also segregated from the rest of the population. So the patients. As we can see from this picture, what the inside looked like in these main buildings. Now, this picture was probably much more crowded than this, but this was the general idea of how people were treated at the time. Lots of windows, lots of light, tall ceilings. But St. Elizabeth's treated mania, depression, dementia, delusions, addiction, epilepsy, syphilis, as well as shell shock, or as we know it today, PTSD. So how were women admitted to the hospital or insane asylum? So family would send them in. You would have a police surgeon assessment done. Someone would call the police, a family member would call the police and that assessment would be done. And then the military itself, since it was a government hospital. So some that were sent were actually mentally ill, but some were not. There was actually um, a lot of the articles that I found going through um, the Washington Post. Some of them really didn't sound like they were insane. And there was a lot of paternalistic language used. So the article headlines that you see off to the side, woman pleads for chance. Annie Matthews will have a year in hospital for liquor cure. So that headline had, in that article itself, exhibited much paternalistic language. I'll read a section of it to you. I am sorry for you, replied Judge Puh. It is a pity that a woman of your extraordinary ability and accomplishments is so addicted to rum. It is tragic. I cannot let you go again. You would be sure to fall into the same rut again. One as weak as you have shown yourself to be will get whiskey if they have to walk miles for it. The only charity I might extend to you is to lock you up for one year. In confinement, you are sure not to get any liquor. You are now filled with it, and I am going to send you to St. Elizabeth's Hospital. After the year is up, you will come out a better and stronger woman, I hope. Then I want you to become a good woman. I know you can do it. As you can see, very paternalistic in nature. 
now release. So there was many options. You could be declared sane by a committee there at the hospital. You could escape. A court case could be drawn. Death or a writ of habeas corpus. I have a couple other Washington Post headlines off to the side. So free doctor escape. He actually had a um, writ of habeas corpus. He was never, his court case just pretty much he was put in, but he was never declared insane. So therefore he was released. And then we have plead for freedom. Carolyn Corbett and daughter two years in asylum. So they had been stuck there two years and had never been declared insane. So it went to court. Um, the most common way to leave St. Elizabeth's was actually through death. Um, quite a few died there. It doesn't show up very much in the record, um, but it did happen quite a bit. Being declared sane happened probably the least. And so what was treatment like for women inside the asylum? So it was very similar to men, actually. Um, women were a marginalized group, but so was the mentally ill. So because of that, it brought men and women to a very similar playing field in treatment. But the treatment was harsh. There was neglect. There was overcrowding. But like I said, similar to men, the medical treatment was the same between men and women. So St. Elizabeth's was known as a premier institution, one of the most advanced, one of the best um, health procedures used, but it was not exempt from overcrowding. So the one headline you can see, Asylum Scored by a Committee. Starting the disclosures follow St. Elizabeth's investigation. Straight jackets are used. Towelling and feeding tube are commend. Warm bodies dissected. If you were wondering, toweling was actually a towel was wrapped around the neck of someone to restrain them. So very harsh treatment. But the most common issue was overcrowding. And then the other article right here, shock for dementia preox to be tried at St. Elizabeth's. It was a revolutionary treatment used at the time. And if you read that article, both men and women were in this first pool. So very, very progressive for the time. Now, in the, in the record, I did not find instances of, at least in the newspapers, of rape or anything like that going on. So that's why my findings show that the treatment between men and women were actually very similar here in the asylum, but like I also said, the asylum still had harsh treatment, neglect, and overcrowding. And then this is my bibliography of the sources that you saw picture and article-wise.